There's a lot of information out there on the internet on what you should do if you have tight hip flexors in general, implying both sides, but a whole lot less on what to do if your problems are only on one side. In this video, I wanna specifically address what you should do if your issues are only on one side and the differences between left and right side hip flexor issues in many cases. The psoas attaches on the lumbar vertebrae themselves and also at the lesser trochanter of the femur, which is this inner portion of the femur right about here. And this attachment allows for that muscle to have leverage to obviously pull the femur up into hip flexion or move the pelvis on the femur into a hip flexed position like this. And this is also a position of what we would refer to as anterior pelvic tilt in a lot of cases. So clearly if we were to have tight hip flexors on both sides, the pelvis would be in this forward position. And many traditional approaches to tight hip flexors would be to massage the area, to foam roll it, and to particularly stretch it with the classic half kneeling hip flexor stretch. But what about if we only have issues on one side? Let's talk about that for a second, but let me preface this by saying that muscles can be tight for a lot of different reasons. It could be because of a strength or weakness imbalance between musculature. It could be because of injury. It could be because a muscle is too short or too long. There are a lot of different reasons why a muscle can be tight, but we're going to use the normal definition of what most people think tightness is, which is a shortened muscle position relative to the normal resting position of what a muscle uses usually is. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to be referring to a tight psoas as a shortened position of the psoas or a concentric position of the psoas. Let's use the left psoas and I'll explain why we choose the left in particular in just a second. But let's imagine that we have the psoas that runs from here down to here. Now, because this muscle is in a shortened position, what can happen at the proximal fibers right here or the fibers closest to the center of the body is that when it contracts, it is going to have an effect on that side of the spine. Meaning that when it contracts and pulls right here and these attachment sites come closer to each other, it's going to actually turn the spine in the opposite direction. So because this contracts, it's going to turn the spine towards the right side as it also pulls this femur forward into an externally rotated position like that. So that's what a tight psoas is going to do if it's just on the left side. So we're going to have a situation where the pelvis is more forward on the left and also that pelvis is going to be more externally rotated along with the hip. And we're also going to have a more internally rotated right hip and a pelvis that's rotated relatively back on that side. There was a study that showed that a relatively normal human spine curve actually faced the right side in most cases. So if we're facing the right side and have a predisposition to facing the right side, that means that the left side is going to be more forward, which means that the left psoas is going to have a predisposition towards being more tight than the right side. So let's address what we can do for a tight psoas on the left side. And then later on, I'll talk about the right side and why that can be tight as well. So what we wanna do, is we wanna facilitate the inverse joint positions pretty much. So we've got a pelvis that's more externally rotated and forward on the left side and the spine is facing the right side. So we want to facilitate the spine turning towards the left and rotating this left pelvis back and also internally rotating that left hip. Those would be the solutions towards getting us to really take stress off of that hip flexor on the left. So what we can do is place ourselves in a position where we can more advantageously access the spine turning left and also left hip internal rotation. And then we can educate the muscles that create those joint actions to work together synchronously. A great place to start is a 90-90 position, meaning 90 degrees of both hip and knee flexion because 90 degrees of hip flexion biases internal rotation of the pelvis. And it's also going to help us target muscles that help create that internal rotation and also help create a shift of the pelvis back and towards the left. Those muscles are particularly your hamstrings, which attach on the back of your pelvis, help pull the pelvis back on that side. Your adductor muscles, which when you are in 90 degrees of hip flexion, help create internal rotation and a shift towards that side and also your oblique muscles, because those muscles attach at the top of your pelvis 
and they help rotate the pelvis back and also turn you towards that side. So if we can get those three muscle groups working synchronously in a position of internal rotation, then that would be the goal and a great way to start. Appreciate how the position of the joints are going to influence musculature and vice versa. And addressing both of those things together is a unique and foundational principle of my programs like my beginner body restoration program. So if you want a program that appreciates these things and also addresses common movement dysfunctions and postural imbalances, then you can check out that program. I'll link it down below as well. So give these a try. This is the 90-90 hip lift with a left hip shift from Postural Restoration Institute. The purpose of this is to pull that left hip from a forward orientation to more of a neutral orientation. So to set up for this, we need to get in a 90-90 position where we have a 90 degree bend at both our knee and our hip, and the feet are flat on the wall. And we have a ball in between our knees that allows us to keep our knees in line with our toes and our knees in line with our hips. So it shouldn't be wider than that. It shouldn't be that much smaller than that. And what we're gonna to do to set up is make sure that we can feel our heels flat on this wall, but we're not gonna peel our toes off. We're gonna keep them flat. And so keeping our hands on our low rib cage, Trevor will have you exhale through your mouth nice and soft as you pull down on that wall with your heels. And again, keeping the whole foot flat, he should feel both hamstrings engage. And he should feel like his tailbone is about an inch or two off of the ground. But if his spine was like Velcro, it's just being peeled one vertebrae at a time off of the ground. But again, he's not going that high. So with both hamstrings engaged, he's now going to do a hip shift. And this is harder than it looks, so make sure you go nice and slow. I'm going to have Trevor shift his right knee up and his left knee down, which is going to move his hips, and that's okay. And then I'm gonna have him press gently into the ball with just his left side, not his right side. So at this point, he should feel his left inner hamstring and his left groin, inner groin muscle engage. The right side should have maybe a little bit of hamstring, but not a lot of muscular tension is happening on this right side. Once he has that, he's gonna exhale through his mouth, getting all that air out, really all of that soft, five to 10 second exhale until he feels his side abs, not his six pack, but a little bit of side abs, and then hold that tension nice and soft as he inhales through his nose. He should feel his rib cage expand. He's gonna do five breaths of that, maintaining this position right here. The truth is most people are gonna have a really hard time feeling their hamstrings with just that wall reference. So we recommend for most people starting off with something supporting their shin, not their entire leg, but just this portion of the shin so that they can stay at a 90-90 angle. You wanna set it up so that the whole foot can still be flat on something, so we're not off the wall digging the back of our heel into something. The whole foot's flat, and then you should be able to feel a lot more hamstring. But again, this isn't a 10 out of 10 hamstring contraction. It should be a four to five out of 10, maybe six. And then he's gonna come up, pulling down with his heels, and then doing that little shift and it should be easier for him to maintain that. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to get in this right side line 90-90 position, meaning we have a 90 degree bend at both our knees and our hips. And we're just gonna support our head with our right hand and arm to make sure that our head is nice and relaxed and chill. And the first thing we're gonna do is make sure we have a ball in between our knees, which is pretty compressible. And when you're just kind of resting in this position, it allows your knees to stay in line with your hips and also your feet like that. Now, depending on the individual, some people will benefit from having the ball further up. Other people will feel it more when it's further back in between their thighs a little bit more. You can experiment around and see what works best for you. But what we need to do is make sure this right foot is flush on the ground right here, but flat on the wall. And this left foot is going to be slightly above the level of the knee. I would recommend staying within, within your active internal rotation range. Whatever that is, I would start there. So if I have 20 degrees of internal rotation on my left hip, I'm probably gonna stay at that point. Now, what we're gonna do is slightly turn the left toes down. This is gonna buy us a little bit more internal rotation. To initiate this, we're going to slightly tuck our hips, do a little posterior pelvic tilt. Now inhale, keeping both feet flat on the wall, but focusing on the left heel, and shift the left knee back Exhale, push down into the ball. You're gonna feel your left inner thigh activate. Also, it can help to push your right knee down into the floor. So both knees go down on the exhale. 
Inhale through your nose, shift the knee a tiny bit further back. If you can't get any further back, have the intention to, and that will kick on your inner thigh a little bit more. What should also be happening is you should feel your left glute med activate. That's gonna be the muscle. If you have this bone right here on the side of your hip, it's gonna be just behind that. Not on the bone or, the, or your TFL muscle, which runs down the side of that bone. It should be slightly behind the bone. That's what you're looking for there. And you wanna integrate that with the inner thigh. So inhale, pull back, exhale, push down. And again, it can be really helpful if you're pushing the right knee down into the ground the entire time as well. If you are feeling that pinchiness in the side of your hip, in your hip flexor, some uncomfortable sensation, maybe in your TFL instead of your glute med, then you can try getting a little further away from the wall. And I wouldn't go beyond about a 60 degree angle at your knees and your hips, but you can work getting a couple inches further away, doing the exact same thing, getting this up a little higher, turning it in, and then that should help most people. The most common mistake in this is that people are gonna lose their foot contacts. So they'll lose something on their foot or their right foot will come off of the wall. Make sure both feet are flat, but the focus is on that left heel. The other thing is people's shoulders are gonna roll forward like that. And that can lead to some uncomfortable sensations and pinchiness in the hips. So make sure you got your shoulder and head stacked over your pelvis here. Now keep in mind this asymmetrical pattern is what most people are biased towards. And I see in the overwhelming majority of cases, most people benefit from addressing the left hip in this context. That doesn't mean that this isn't going to be potentially helpful for your right side. It could be. It's just that you might need to take a couple extra steps on top of that. So if you want to learn more about this asymmetrical pattern and other patterns of associated with it, then you can check out this left AIC video, which I'll link down below in the description. Okay, now a lot of you may be asking, what if my right side has tighter hip flexors? In this case, it's usually one of two potential things. Now I'm going to be talking about the most common reasons why I see tighter right hip flexors, but if you want more information and solutions, and exercise videos that can help with this, then you can check out the article I'm writing alongside this video, which I'll be linking in the description below. It will have a lot more information, visuals, and exercises that will help for this. Now, the other reason is, is that we can't effectively push out of our right side, and we are pulling ourselves forward with our right hip flexors. What I mean by that is because the pelvis tends to be more forward on the left, the right side tends to be biased towards a position of internal rotation relative to left external rotation. If that is the case, we're more biased towards loading ourselves on the right side, right? Now, our right glute max helps create external rotation of the femur and the hip closing off this space right here. So that way we can push from right to left. The right glute max tends to be more underdeveloped and also underactive relative to the left because of this. Now what would be helpful here is instead of us pulling ourselves forward with our right hip flexors, we can educate the right glute max to push us out of our right side more effectively. And here's one way that you can do that. So to set up for this, we want to be at about a 90 degree angle. Now I'm going to discuss different lengths you can be away from the wall to feel more glute, but most people are going to feel a lot of glute in this 90-90 position. So Trevor, what I want you to do is I want you to exhale through your mouth as you pull one leg off of the wall and hug it to your chest, staying nice and relaxed and dig into the wall, push into the wall, feeling the inner edge of his heel and also the ball of his big toe. He's keeping the whole foot flat, but the purpose of this is to drive into the wall with this ball of the big toe and also the inner edge of the heel. Now, as he does that, he's going to breathe through it. He should feel some glute on the down leg. Every time he exhales, he wants to tuck just a little bit more, trying to reach his back pocket for his heel there. That's going to allow him to keep and maintain that tuck. He should feel a good bit of lower glute of the leg that's on the wall. Now, if you don't feel a good bit of glute of the foot that's on the wall, you can modify this by getting slightly further away from the wall. Sometimes this helps people, especially those with less hip flexion, create a better push into the wall with the inner edge of it to feel that glute max. So now he can pull this leg back, feel that same foot pressure, everything stays the same. As he exhales, he's gonna try tucking just slightly more, trying to reach that back pocket towards that heel as he keeps the inner edge of that foot driving into the wall. Breathing through it, exhaling through his mouth until he feels a little bit of side abs, pausing, inhaling through his nose. 
For maximum results, do two sets of five breaths in the morning, two sets of five breaths in the evening sometime as well. If you want maximum results, try two sets of about five to 10 breaths in the morning and at night. And that should really start to help you feel better in your movement. And if you want to learn more, again, check out my beginner body restoration program, which I will link down below.